We're filming a second video on the same day with different outfits. We're doing the glasses this time. I'm still on the cushions and we still have the bad background. So welcome back. you guys if you saw a video I posted I think two weeks ago Tracy and I did a video on why you shouldn't use the word handicapped and honestly talked about a whole lot of other interesting disability related stuff so that video right there you should check that out Tracy was my disability mentor and has really helped me develop my own view of myself as a disabled woman but also just a better view of the community more understanding so she's been pivotal in basically me becoming me to be honest. She was my teacher from 16, 17, 18. And in this video, we are going to be discussing something that has been long overdue, long requested, that I have mentioned many a time on my channel, and then been like, let me know if you want a video about it. And everyone's like, yeah, Molly, we want the video about it. And then I just <laughs> continue to not do it. Because honestly, um, I live in California, Tracy lives in Toronto. And so we haven't had the opportunity to sit down and discuss it. And I really did want to discuss it with Tracy here because she's the one who not only taught me about it, but teaches many people about it and is honestly far more educated about it than I am. So I would rather have her here to have this discussion together than just to do it on my own. Also, I want to mention, just like I mentioned the last time in the last video, which is the same day, we are currently following all COVID guidelines. I don't know what the guidelines will be when this video goes live, but we are following the current guidelines in the city that we are currently in. So that aside, let's jump into it. If you guys listened to my audiobook, it's not what it looks like. I did also briefly talk about social model versus medical model of disability in that book. And that book was really dedicated to the things that I really wanted to talk about, but was too scared to talk about on YouTube. Mm -hmm. To be honest, that was like the theme of the book was like, what are all the things that I really want to get off my chest and really believe in or I think are important for people to hear but I'm like worried that if I make a YouTube video about it people are just going to go to the comment section and like tear me apart or be really mean or be very judgmental because I'm coming into this conversation and I don't know how you feel about this because you educate people on this topic all the time but I found that when I briefly brought it up in YouTube videos in the past able-bodied people get very offended by it as just a general concept. And for me as an able-bodied person, um, a conflict that I have often is that sometimes people with disabilities aren't sure of it either. Mm -hmm. And who am I as an able-bodied person to kind of preach a method or a, um, a message about disability that maybe they aren't ready to embrace yet either. Yes. So that makes it complicated too. Well, and that's fair because, you know, I've known you for 10 years now, almost 11 years. When you brought it up to me, I was like, well, this is just offensive. So I know, and that's the other reason it's hard for me to bring it up because I know that it took me like four or five years to not only uh, understand it, but accept it as my own belief system. This was not like I just, Tracy brought it up to me one day and I was like, oh, that makes perfect sense. No, I was like many people raised in the medical model of disability. And so for me at 16, having just lost most of my vision two years prior and spending my entire life hoping for a cure and not only hoping for one, but literally being the face of a charity looking for a cure, it was offensive. So for me as a disabled person, it took me many years to, to listen to you talking about it, looking things up, reading articles, reading blogs by disabled people to, to not only stop hating the idea, but to then be like, okay, I, well, I, I still don't believe it or accept it. Like I get that other people do to then being like, okay, I understand it more, but I still don't believe it to then finally, like in my early twenties being like, no, actually this is completely what I believe and feel and resonates with me as a person and how I want to live my life and the way that I choose to believe. And so I know that in making a video, if this is a concept that um, other disabled people have never heard of who have been raised in the medical model. You're right. It could be difficult for them to hear this and to understand it. And it is certainly, in my experience, difficult for able-bodied people to understand it. And I think it's important to recognize that when, when Molly was hearing about it from me, it wasn't like I was sitting down all the time giving her lessons. No. I think that if you've watched Molly's video um, regularly, if you've watched her videos, you hear her say things that are just really grounded in social model. And if you understand social model of disability, you would know that. And I think that that's gonna be the same experience that most people will have. 
you're probably not going to watch our video and immediately have your entire perspective changed. But I think it'll cause you now, I hope it will cause you after we talk about it a bit more to notice in your life examples of the medical model mm -hmm. and realize the shift in your thinking that um, would move you towards a social model of disability and move you towards then greater acceptance and empowerment of people with disabilities. I think what's really important to me about um, this video and again like why it's been really hard for me to just like bite the bullet and make it is I know for me this was life-changing and like I said it, it wasn't overnight it took me many years I heard the same lecture from you <laughs> summer after summer and it, it took me a long time but once I got there it was life-changing and when I connect with people who are disabled, who are still very rooted in medical model and maybe have never even heard of social model because truly, despite the fact that I was deeply immersed in the disability community from the time I was diagnosed as a young child, I had never heard of it until you brought it up to me. It is not surprising to me that many disabled people have still never heard of it. it it's so significant. And when I meet people who have never heard of it or who are very, um, deeply enmeshed in the medical model, I feel sad because I do know how deeply life-changing it was for me, how incredibly empowering it was for me. I, I just want to help be a part of creating that shift in other people's mindsets to hopefully help free them because that's how it felt for me. Um, it felt freeing to walk away from the medical model. And I think that, that the medical model helps to kind of oppress people in ways that they don't recognize. And so often the oppressed person doesn't know that they're oppressed. And so... Um, well, I remember the first time you told me something. I came to you, I was very upset. And I was like, I don't know why I'm so upset about this, but I am. And you were like, well, because that is a classic example of oppression. You are being oppressed. And I was like, wow, I have a right to feel this way, to feel sad about this thing, or to feel angry that this is happening because it isn't okay. And I think that um, that the reality for people with disabilities is that they tend to be surrounded. They likely are surrounded by people who don't have that same disability as them. They don't have that same life experience as them. And lots of those people, particularly their loved ones, are certainly approaching them from a positive kind of mindset and, and they're trying to be encouraging. But if they aren't thinking of it in, if they're still thinking of it in this kind of medical way, in this way that says, it's really sad what's happened to you. It's really difficult that this has happened to you. And we just need to do things to make this life easier for you. Mm -hmm. We need you to do things to make life easier for you. If that's the approach they're taking versus um, we can recognize that this isn't really working for you. And it's this that's the problem. Right? <laughs> that shift um, will make all the difference. Yeah. And if you're, if you're surrounded by people who don't necessarily think that way, just because they're not aware of it, then you continue to be oppressed mm -hmm. by it, right? And the reality is most disabled children are born to able-bodied parents or are living in households with able-bodied people. And so, for example, my parents, you know, weren't involved in disability at all when they had me and surprise, your child's gonna go blind. And so they didn't know where to turn and they asked the doctors. And what are the doctors going to do? They're gonna connect you into the world of medical model because mm -hmm. that's their job. And that is their belief system. Then it ends up just becoming this cycle of these parents being like, oh my gosh, I have no idea about disability. I don't know what to do. Turning to the medical community, being introduced to the medical model, and then that is the way the child is raised. And it just becomes the cycle. And that I think is why in society, so many able-bodied people follow the medical model because that's what we're, sh that's what we're shown. That's what we see. And so before we continue this conversation, I just want to give you kind of like a brief synopsis of what like medical versus social really is. The easiest way that I was able to place it in my mind is the medical model is the belief that the disabled person is the problem and we need to cure them, right? We need to cure them, fix them, heal them, solve their problem, change them, change them as an individual to make them fit into society. The social model is the idea that I, as the blind person, am not the issue. I'm not the problem. Me, Molly, who I am, is perfectly fine. What we need to change is the environment around me, is the uh, access that I have to opportunity through accessible des design, through universal design. Um, and so it really takes the onus off me. For me, growing up deeply immersed in medical model, 
I did grow up feeling like I was a burden. I did grow up feeling like me being blind was a problem, that I was not good enough, that I was not whole, that I was in some way broken because I wasn't able-bodied. And if you can imagine growing up with that mindset, how deeply damaging that is to mental health, how stunting that would be to your own growth and development as a person. Because if, if we think about young disabled people being raised to believe that they are inherently not good enough, that they are broken, that they are damaged and need to be changed or fixed to fit into society and to succeed, well, those kids are never going to grow up to be able to feel the confidence to succeed, to reach their goals, to even attempt to be a strong, capable, confident leader. Because their brain and their mind, they've been told their entire life that we must cure you. And the reality is cures don't exist for most of us, even for myself. You know, when I was diagnosed, my parents were told that there was hope that I'd be cured within 10 years. Well, that would have been like, 2008, which is exactly the year that I went blind. And there was no hope. At this point, we now know I have RP Tulip 1, which is one of the rarest types of RP. And so in fact, there's less hope than ever that I will be cured because the reality is we're always gonna look to cure the most common. And there's like a hundred in line before mine. And if society is focused um, and charities and science is focused on finding a cure, what they're not necessarily focused on is making the changes that will make your life better in the here and now. And so if the, if the focus that we have is to cure disability, mm -hmm. there are lots of um, charities whose primary focus is that, then we lose track of the fact that there are lots and lots of things that we can do in society that would make your life far better. Right. And so instead of focusing for far more equitable. Mm -hmm. So instead of focusing on curing one individual that may never get cured and is millions of dollars being synced into this, we could focus on making our environment and our society more universally accessible to everybody who lives in it. Um, which overall ends up being less expensive and more beneficial to people outside of the disability community, right? We call it the curb cut phenomenon. The idea that the curb cut was designed for people in wheelchairs or who use walkers. However, all of us with a skateboard, a bike, pushing a baby stroller, pulling their suitcase, benefit from that curb cut. Text messaging was designed for the deaf community as an alternative to phone calls. Well, I would say most of us text more than we have phone calls. And so a lot of design that was initially created for disability ends up being far more beneficial for everybody. So if you look at it that way, when we're putting our money into something, if we put our money into the environment, into everyone, instead of putting our money into a cure for one person that realistically may never come, it seems like the social model is like the clear answer to this problem. A really simple way that I often explain it to people that makes them kind of get it in a moment is that we know that there are things that people who have a, a darker skin tone can use to lighten their skin tone. Mm -hmm. We know that life in North America is much harder if you're black than if you're white. But the solution to that isn't for them to change their pigment, change mm -hmm. their skin tone. That's not the solution at all. We all know that, there's yeah. no doubt about that. Clearly that's not the solution. Yet somehow that's the kind of situation that we, we kind of play people with disabilities in. We mm. say, you've got a problem, let's see if we can fix you. As opposed to, we've got this problem, and the problem is that we aren't um, making our society accessible to everyone, right. and so what are the things that we can do with it? The reality is, if I go somewhere like a restaurant, and they have a braille menu, I'm not disabled. If I try to use an app to order myself dinner, and it's accessible, I'm not disabled, right? Because I'm able to do the same thing independently that an able-bodied person is doing. However, if I go to a restaurant and they don't have a braille menu and Tracy has to read the menu to me, I am now disabled because I cannot independently do something. If I go to order myself food and the app is not accessible, I am now disabled because I'm handing my phone to Tracy to order my dinner for me. And so that's kind of where this goes, right? Is, is my disability is only troubling when my environment isn't accommodating of the way I need to do things. As a disabled person, the biggest challenges um, that weigh on me emotionally um, and that make my life more difficult are actually fixable. My eyes are not fixable. So why are we focusing on fixing the thing that is not fixable? 
instead of fixing the thing that is. And we know that um, science is investing loads of time, energy, money, intellect into these cures. But the same kind of science can go into developing the technologies that we know are making your life far more accessible now. Um, we know that there are great advancements in technology, um, but, um, but that could happen even more if they, re if they diverted the kind of money away from this focus on the cure and started focusing on, on um, the technologies that might help us to live more independently. Another thing that I think is important to talk about when we look at the medical model is, is the way we talk about cures, because I have a lot of problems with it. One of the things that I have a problem with is the word cure. We often think like cure, a paralyzed person can walk, a blind person can see, a deaf person can hear. But when we think about a cure in the actual community, the reality is science says that's not gonna happen. You know, when I talked to my doctor about what a cure would look like for me, she said, you will never get full vision back. We know right now, that's just probably never gonna be scientifically possible. The amount of damage has been done and we can only do so much. And so a cure for me might look like getting a little more light perception, might look like maybe seeing blurs of color. Is that that meaningful to me? Does that help really in the grand scheme of my life? Honestly, no, it doesn't. And so again, when we're pouring all this money, all this time, effort, energy, and then going through what will most likely be a pervasive like mm -hmm. medical surgery and then rehabilitation after that right because just like i had to go through rehab when i went blind i would also have to go through rehab when i regained sight and it's not like i would just regain a bit of sight and automatically know that's red and yeah. automatically know how to de deconstruct what i am seeing again if you want to learn more about that idea you can look up any video about cochlear implants mm. and so cochlear implants have been around for a long time now and for a lot of people, they regard it as a cure for deafness. In, in fact, it's certainly made really positive changes in the lives of some people. It's a deeply controversial kind of idea. I've watched a great show uh, that involves it recently. If you haven't seen it, it's on Netflix called Deaf You. It's really great and an interesting kind of insight to it. But um, when you watch videos about people who, who receive cochlear implants, the idea that, well, now their, their ears can receive the sounds um, but that their brain has to learn how to interpret those sounds mm -hmm. and goes and kind of go through that whole process. That's kind of, this, it's, it's the exact same yeah. thing as Molly's saying she would go through if, if there was some degree of vision restored. And the, the other problem I have with kind of the cure community is the way they pose it, right? As I talked about earlier, the emotional impact it has on the individual who is disabled it is huge because I know as literally the face of a charity poster child poster literal poster child mm -hmm. of a charity who looked for cures the way it was often talked about in front of me was to, to pity me this little girl will never see the face of her baby smile she will never see her husband at the end of the aisle on her wedding day she won't be able to they talk about all the things you will never be able to do, how much harder your life's gonna be, how much worse your life is going to be, and you absorb that. Trust me, I understood it. That's why I wanted a cure so bad, because I was taught that my life was gonna suck if I wasn't cured. And so it's so damaging. The reality is, if, if as a disabled person, you would like to be cured one day, I don't judge you because I completely understand. That's what I wanted for like 18 years of my life. And I'm not here trying to tell you, you shouldn't want to be cured. If that's what you want, that's what you want. But I don't think that you should live your life waiting to be cured, that you should hope for it, that you should wait for it, that that should be the end goal. And I think if you follow Molly's life and her career, what you'll know is that when she came to accept her disability, that's when her life really opened up the most for her. She already um, uh, was already successful in many ways up until then, but when that shift in her thinking changed and her acceptance of herself and her blindness changed, that's when her world of opportunities really opened up for her and she mm -hmm. was really able to come into her own. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I, I'm a part of a lot of RP support groups on Facebook. And, you know, I do see a lot of more newly diagnosed people going through that, you know, like, what, what, what's the research? Give me all the hope. I, I want, I want the cure. Like, what, what are, what are my hopes? And I just saw yesterday somebody say, you know, for those of you who are more advanced, 
who are further along in your RP journey, what piece of advice would you give your, your newly diagnosed or younger self? It made me really sad to see how many people were saying, go travel and hike mm -hmm. and, and do all these things. And I was like, you can do that when you're blind. And I was sad to see that so many of the responses to this person asking this question were like, hike while you can, travel mm -hmm. the world. And for me, it was sad because I still do all those things and I still enjoy them greatly. And to me, it's like this doomsday of like, live your best life until you can't no longer, mm -hmm. which is again, this, this idea that we're not going to have a good, successful, positive life experience mm -hmm. if we're disabled. And if there are things like that that you can't do anymore, it's not because you're blind. It's because those things aren't set up to work for you. And so it might mean that you have to look for the right trail that's appropriately uh, accommodated. The trails that I hike in in Muskoka by my cottage have rails along the side of them now so that you can run your hand along as you're walking and make sure you're not walking off a cliff. Um, I love that. <laughs> um, and so sometimes just as you talk about your parents looking for different activities for you, as, as some activities maybe became more difficult for you, looking for other ways to do it or, or different activities to immerse yourself in, we want people with disabilities to have full and rich lives. Mm -hmm. And so a big focus on a person who might become disabled should be on looking for those opportunities in their lives. And we, we also just in society, we talk a lot about self-love, self-acceptance, living your best life. And so those things should translate to disabled people. You know, for, for me, learning to love myself meant learning to accept and embrace my disability and not to see it as my enemy, as, as a broken or negative piece of me, but to see it as just a piece of me that yes, has its challenges, presents challenges, but also presents so much beauty mm -hmm. and has given me so much in life. And I, I really, I don't blame my parents, you know, for, for immersing me in this community. I don't blame any parents who do because that's what they know and that's what they're told. And they, they do what they believe is best. And I know that my parents just wanted to see me live a good life. Um, and to them, they were told that meant a cure. And when I went to my parents one day on, on my self-acceptance journey and on this medical model versus social model journey, when I made that transition over, I went to them and I was like, by the way, like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be cured. This isn't, this isn't my thing anymore. Just like it was a burden lifted off of me. It was a burden lift off of them to just be like, great. Like we've always loved you the way you are. We always thought you were good enough but we thought that you needed this. And so it went both ways. It was relieving for me as a disabled person, but also for those in my life. When I think about Molly's younger experiences and her um, campaign work that she did um, for charities, I often think about the amount of time that she invested, effort that she invested into those kind of speeches and that kind of activity, searching for a cure that could have been invested in other aspects of her life in a, just a logistical sense. When you have a society that's set up for you, it takes far less time for you to do the everyday activities and that gives you more time to do all the other incredible things that you could do with your life. So as an able-bodied person yourself who heavily works within the disability community, I want to know like what, what your journey was, like how did you get to this place? And so I was always had some interest in disability. My interest specifically came from the fact that we moved around a lot and I could always make friends really quickly with the people who maybe didn't have as many friends, the kids with disabilities. And uh, I had a college diploma already, but when I went to university and had professors that had disabilities, when it was at Ryerson University, I was exposed to these ideas of the social model of disability and I could listen to and value their voices among all the others that I heard before because they were having that lived experience. And so I would really encourage you, if you want to learn more about this, to be really looking for content that's not created by charities necessarily, but it's created mm -hmm. instead by um, dis disabled people themselves, disability activists, disability um, uh, academics and creators yeah. um, and listen to their voices and hear what they have to say about it. There are so many great blogs written by disabled people. TikTok I find is like a hub of empowered disabled creators. Like there are so many empowered disabled creators on TikTok, which I just love seeing. For some reason, it seems like our community has taken off the most on that platform, which has been super great. But there's, there's, there's so many amazing journalists who write 
from this perspective who are disabled. So definitely it is so important to not just listen to my voice as a disabled woman or to Tracy's voice as somebody involved in this community, but to look for other voices who echo this sentiment and who share both sides of, of the medical model versus social model coin. And I think something that, that plays into this that we haven't tapped on quite yet is, is inspiration porn. I did this video quite a few years ago that's dedicated to talking about it, so I would definitely check out that if you wanna hear more about it. I'll also link the late Stella Young's TED Talk who coined the phrase inspiration porn. It's something I talked about in my audiobook as well. But do you want it? Do you sure. want to take it away for this yeah. one? Yeah. And so often with when people, when able-bodied people see people with disability, it's really because they're used to kind of make able-bodied people feel better about themselves by being presented in kind of an inspirational role. And so they don't do it intentionally that way. When they create that kind of content, um, Molly's poster girl days, when they create that kind of content. It's supposed to kind of make you feel good about yourself. If I uh, if I look at her, oh my gosh, look what she's doing. Um, but it sends this kind of subliminal message that you're surprised she's able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, often the thing she's doing isn't really that incredible. Um, we all have experiences in our life that are complicated and uh, make our realities different. Um, and we all learn to kind of cope and adapt and, and move on from that. And that's the same, the same experience that people with disabilities have. But inspiration porn says that just as porn is used in a way that objectifies some people for other people's gain, um, so too is this kind of um, content, the poster girl, the telethon kind of idea. If I look at you and I think, oh my gosh, it's really great that she's doing that. Thank goodness that's not me. Mm -hmm. And it separates us further and it really um, puts you on a pedestal for things that aren't incredible. And so, or puts able-bodied people on a pedestal mm -hmm. for doing things that involve disabled mm -hmm. people. Pat, pat, pat. I'm going to pat you yeah. on the head. Wow, well, look yeah. how good it is that you're dating a disabled woman as an able-bodied man. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, no, I'm actually a valid human that contributes to the relationship just as much as they do. Yeah. So it's, it's either used to hype the able-bodied person for being so good to disabled people or to put this disabled person on an unrealistic pedestal for doing basic everyday human things, for simply existing and living as a disabled person. And I, I think, you know, I, I've often been in two minds because I see the true exploitative nature, which it really is at times like, aggressively exploitative of the disabled person and are often talking about the disabled person like they're not humans that would understand what's being said about them. And that's very problematic. But the other side of the coin is there, there are things that as a disabled person are incredibly challenging for me to do. And I do feel accomplished when I, when I reach that goal. I remember you very excitedly calling me because you'd made salad on your own for the first time. Yeah, <laughs> it was like, that's a big deal. And, and you know, for, for a lot of people, crossing four lanes of traffic in a busy city at 26 is not a big deal. For me, it is. For me, it is still literally scary every time. If that is, if it is not a vibrating or beeping accessible crosswalk and I have to use my ears, I am still terrified when I take that step. And I'm still feeling accomplished when I reach the other side. So it's hard for me because, because I do see the truly exploitative nature when, it, when it's very extreme. But also there are things in my life that I do feel like people should recognize are challenging. Because if you don't recognize the challenge I went through to accomplish the task, then we don't create change and we don't create conversation about what needs to change to make that task easier. It kind of makes me think of the difference when we talk about equality and equity. And mm. Um, Molly is often the example I use since as a teacher my students all know her but we can immediately say that equality says everybody gets the equal things well life would not be fair at all to Molly if what she got is the same things that I got we know that certain things will take tons and tons more effort or totally different technology in order to make things work for you and we want a society that's really equitable, that gives everyone what they need to be as successful as they can. And so sometimes that means acknowledging that um, turning the assignment in on time isn't nearly as important as giving her the time that she needs to be able to, to rise to the same level as everyone mm -hmm. else and, and, and do kind of her best, best possible version of herself.
speaking of um, equality, right? Mm -hmm. Like if everything's equal, it isn't actually fair. Mm -hmm. My favorite thing is when people like tell me as a disabled person, life isn't fair. And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> I got that message mm -hmm. a long time ago, trust me. But yeah, I think this video is already so long and there's so much more we could continue to talk about. If you guys have questions or if this has sparked interest in your mind and you want to hear more about one or multiple topics that we touched on in this video, please comment down below and let me know because we could potentially do like a follow-up Q&A video to answer more questions about it. I'm going to link as many resources as I can down below so you can continue your exploration and continue to open your mind. Like we said at the beginning, this wasn't to make you change your mind in a 30 minute video. Let's be real, probably 40 minute video. <laughs> this was to make you get interested, to make you be curious, um, to make you question maybe the way that you think or the things that you've been told either as a disabled person about yourself and the community or as an able-bodied person about disability in general. Um, it's simply to start the conversation because that's how change begins. And I hope that as you go through your days now, you'll start to kind of notice some of those things, some of those, some of those um, sites of oppression or some of those um, sites of inaccessibility and say, what can I do to be a part of this? How can I make this better? A fun little extension, now all of a sudden I'm going on again. A fun little extension this Halloween was that because of COVID, everyone had these shoots to put their candy down. And uh, one of our friends from high school, Elizabeth, posted that it would be the first time that she was able to actually trick or treat mm. because she didn't have to go up the stairs. And so there are lots of opportunities out there for ways that we as individuals can make a difference in even just individuals in our communities. And so um, that doesn't necessarily mean charitable work, though we do lots of that too. We're not dismissing that. But, it, but there might be opportunities where you personally can make a difference to people as well. Mm -hmm. And I know that, speaking of charitable work, we know that a lot of it comes from good intentions, right? It's not coming from malice. It's not trying to be harmful. They're trying to create good. Um, it can just sometimes be misguided or, you know, uh, land in the, in the wrong way because oftentimes these things are started by able-bodied people mm -hmm. speaking for our community. Um, so that is another food for thought that we could delve into, but that's a different conversation for a different day because we've gone on long enough. I encourage you, if you haven't checked out the video already, to check out this video that we did on why you shouldn't use the word handicapped and check out this video I did, a Q&A all about my guide dog Gallup's retirement. All right, thanks for watching. Thanks for being here, Tracy, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.